Hello everyone, I'm Henriette uh, from Pro-Arm Strings. Welcome to the Pro-Arm Strings Violin School and this live class called Henriette Goes Live, that's what it is, uh, where you can ask any violin related questions. We've done this format a few times in the past and I think lots of people really enjoyed it. So welcome if you have joined us just now and we will hopefully do it again in a few weeks or months time we'll see uh, find this channel here regularly and uh, if you subscribe to the channel you you will get notified whenever these classes are on so welcome if you are here and before we get to the content of this course today where you can ask questions let me just talk you through um, how you can ask questions uh, on my screen and I think on yours as well to the right of your screen you've got a chat box in which you can write so right at the bottom you can probably see your name and the words say something any questions that you'd like to ask please use that chat box and I get to read them at my end um, and I'm hopefully be a I'll hopefully be able to go through this chat box and answer the questions one by one if I forget your question, I apologise in advance. Uh, please ask it again or tell me that I've forgotten your question. We will also be answering a couple of questions that have come in uh, as a result of people watching videos on the channel. And some of those questions are really quite valid and maybe of general use. So uh, we, I will answer those as well. So let's see if we can start using and practicing the chat box by writing a few words. Perhaps you can write wherever you live because it's always really nice for me to see uh, where the people are that are joining this class. So if you write where you live, um, I live in the UK. Um, so I'm writing that there now. I live in Norwich, UK. And then I hit the send button. And there you hopefully can see that. So do please write in the chat box wherever you are. It's really interesting for me and others to see as well. Ah, here's another person from the UK. Welcome, Mr. Matthews uh, from Birmingham, UK. That's lovely. Anybody else here from anywhere else in the world? Whilst we're waiting for your answers to come through, feel free to write in there and also feel free if you don't want to disclose who you are just to stay here in this in this class. All good. Now, if you feel that you are wanting to support this channel because you get a lot out of it and some people write to me and luckily, I, I, this is why I make the videos to allow people to play better, please uh, use these um, little icons below the chat box. You can see the emoji icon if you like what we're doing. Um, then you might click on that. If you want to support this channel uh, uh, in a monetary form, you can buy super chats and super stickers that um, pin your comments to the top. Now, you can do that, and YouTube it takes quite a, um, a considerable chunk. What you can also do is um, use PayPal and use info at programstrings.com and that way you can support this channel directly. So hello from Kent, I get a message here. Welcome Linda, good to see you here. Is there anybody else that wants to show who they are and say hello as well? Uh, and um, so I was just explaining the icons at the bottom of the chat box. So the, the emoji is if you want to add an emoji, the, the dollar sign is if you want to uh, support this channel uh, in a monetary way. And then there is a, a poll, and I don't think today we're going to use the poll. So <laughs> um, you know where we are if you want to ask a question. Just write it in the te text box, hit send, and it will come up on your screen. Now, whilst we're waiting for the first questions to be asked, uh, let me start by answering a question that has come in um, below one of the videos. And I can't honestly remember uh, which video this is. And this is a question about the quality of the sound of the G string. And this person has said, when I play on the strings, uh, I, I hear a very clear sound on the E string, the A string and the D string. 
but my G string doesn't sound too good. And I have a feeling if you can make a good sound on any of the other three strings, uh, I would assume that there is something that's not quite right with your G string. Now, before I say what might be wrong, so I'll, I'm going to um, suggest a couple of possible solutions to that. I'm just going to say hello to Rihanna Arifa. She's from India and very nice to meet you too, Rihanna. Welcome and I hope you enjoy and have some questions. So let me carry on with the question that I was answering. So I have a feeling that if this is you watching this video and your G string isn't sounding as good as the other strings, there might be an issue with your G string. Now, strings can actually naturally go out of tune when they get a little bit older. So uh, if you read some books about violin playing, some books will say you need to replace your strings every year. Yes, if you play an awful lot, you will have to do that. But you don't have to. You can also wait until you find that your strings sound less clear or whether you sometimes find that the winding that is round the core of the string has come loose, then obviously you want to um, replace your strings. When you replace your strings, do not replace them all together because strings, when you put them new onto a string, uh, onto a violin, they stretch a little bit. And you don't want four strings to be stretching all at the same time because that is a nightmare tuning your violin. So if you are thinking of replacing your strings, uh, replace them one by one and then wait another two weeks or so before you replace the next string. And then wait another two weeks until your last new string has been uh, played in all right before you then add the next string. Now, how can I check that my strings are still good to play? And I'm hoping you can see this. There is a very simple method, and I have to apologize for the sound quality. We have been trying to improve the sound quality, and I'm hoping that in future classes, the sound quality will be as good as you expect. So, but let me show you. Take a look, when I pluck this string, I'm using my G string here as an example, and I want you to take a look for the expanse of the vibrating string. And you can see this is a fairly fresh G string. You can see that it, it expands when it vibrates and it expands very evenly. I'll do it again. Have a look if you can see it. See, it vibrates and then very slowly it vibrates narrower and narrower. So this is a sign of a good string. Let me see what my other strings are like. And it might be good, it might not be. I don't know. Now this, this D string has actually a slightly shorter vibrating time. Can you see that? It is. It doesn't stay expanding and compressing uh, as long as the G string. Look, there's my G, wider, and it's still vibrating. And now it's stopped. And the D string, there it goes. And it goes down slightly earlier. So that means that my D string is slightly older than my G string. Let's see what the A string does. Now the A string vibrates even more short, shortly. So that A string, I might keep an eye on it and think, okay, that might be the first string that I'm going to replace if the time comes. What about my E? Ah, now that one is actually my newest string. And this one goes on vibrating for quite a lot longer. Can you hear that? So my E string is the freshest, shall we say. It's the newest. It vibrates for a really long time and you can see the expanse evenly going down. Now, this will be well worth checking on your violin because if you can see the vibrations go out, then back in and then back out again, it means your string goes out of tune. And that sometimes happens with strings. And if you see two little bulges in your vibrating string, it's time to replace this string. So if you are the person who asked me this question about their G string not producing a good sound, you might do this little simple test. And then you might come to the conclusion that your G string actually needs replacing because I can't actually see any other reason why your string wouldn't sound good if you get a really good sound from your other strings as well. 
So in the meantime, somebody else has written some more comments. So just bear with me for a moment while I read that. Um, really love these sessions. So helpful. Please, could you explain about ringing notes and how they can help with intonation? Yes, I will do that in a second. Good question. And it comes together with the strings being in tune. So I'll come to that in a second. And then, hello from Indonesia. Welcome. Dede, really nice to see you here. And for me, it's just absolutely lovely to see that people literally from all over the world are here, aren't they? So welcome, everyone. Um, we were talking about a ringing sound. Now, when a note, imagine a note and the spot on point where your note is in tune, imagine it has a little circle and this is the black note, the black dot in the middle of your circle and that is your note that is absolutely perfectly in tune. Now around that little dot, so sort of on the edges of what's in tune, there is a sort of, I call it the grey area where your note doesn't sound horrendously out of tune but it isn't perfectly in tune either. Um, and we tend sometimes to play in this grey area of a note, which is almost in tune, but not quite perfectly in tune. Uh, and when you get that, the note doesn't ring as well because the string isn't vibrating in an optimum way, isn't it? So we try to hit that black dot in the middle of a, of a note where your note is perfectly in tune. Um, and when you do that, you get overtones. And overtones are... Uh, this has something to do with acoustics and I'm not going to go and I don't know very much about um, the scientific aspect of acoustics, but you get other strings to ring along because they ring at the same or similar frequencies as the string you're playing. So I might play an, an E, for instance, on the A string. And if my E is perfectly in tune on the A string, my E string is going to ring along and you get that extra ringing sound from your violin because it's not only your A string ringing then but also your E string is ringing along and that is the ringing sound that we're always looking uh, to achieve. So what I am saying with this ringing, what I mean by this ringing sound is that you hit the note precisely in the speed sweet spot where it is the best in tune that's what we're aiming for rather in that gray area where your note is still called in tune shall we say but not encouraging the other strings and the overtones to ring along you see so you might um practice this a little bit especially when you have when you play the e on the a string so with the fourth finger or if you've learned the third position you might play an e in the third position on the a string and then listen if your E string is going to sound along. Now, this same aspect of strings joining in, we can use as well. I don't know if you can already play vibrato. That would be excellent if you do. If you play an, an open G string and you can't play vibrato on an open E string, you might play vibrato on the third finger on the D string instead. And this is an interesting experiment if you can play vibrato. Play vibrato on the third finger on the D string, which is also the note G. If you play on that one and then you you play vibrato on the third finger on D and you play with your bow on the G string, you will hear the vibrato because the overtones, the other ringing sounds that you're playing are played with vibrato. So it's it looks as if you're playing vibrato on an open G string. I'm hoping that's clear. Uh, let me just have a look at my chat box for a moment. Um, should there be a little downward position of the right hand to help in proper position of the bow? Hello, Deborah from Massachusetts. You would say, good question. I'm, I'm not sure I understand it correctly. Let me just read it. Should there be a little downward position of the right hand to help proper finger position on the bow? Ah. Um, thank you for this question. And um, Rahina, Rihanna, I will just come to your question in a minute. Good question as well. Uh, when we hold the bow, let me just get my bow. 
Um, there are different violin schools that promote different bowings, and I don't know whether you're an advanced player or a beginner, but I'll I'll try and make my answer as uh, general as possible, so that as most as many people as possible can benefit from the answer. Um, there are two different schools that say keep your hand really nice and flat, and with that we mean keep your forearm and your the, the the bones in your hand and then into your middle finger keep that as flat as you can you can see almost you can put a ruler uh, uh, next to it and it is really quite flat here what i often see is people playing like this so they've got a, a little bit of an angle here okay so if if that is you you want to try as a general thing in violin playing if you need to try and bend your fingers more so that becomes nice and flat. Okay. Now, there are schools of violin playing, of, of bowing schools, shall I call them, um, that say, oh, no, your wrist needs to be the highest point. You can still see that this bit is more or less flat here. Can you see that? But my wrist is the highest point. And you're pulling and pushing the bow while it is hanging off your wrist, shall, shall we say it. I'm hoping it makes sense. Um, and that gives you a lighter sound because you're not pushing the bow into the string as much when you get everything flat, um, but you might have your wrist a little bit higher and therefore um, be a bit lighter as you as you manipulate more the bow with your with your arm and your wrist is higher, you see. So there are different ways of thinking about violin playing, whether you're like that or like that. Now, what you can do quite easily when you're flat, and I'll demonstrate this without a bow, is I can move my hand sideways. Can you see that? And that is going to help me with my bowing. That is a little bit more difficult to do when your wrist is higher. Can you see that? You might try this without your bow as well, keeping it flat, and then see if you can move your hand from left to right, or drop your hand, which for some people in itself is quite difficult to do. And now move it sideways, you've got less movement there. At least many people have less movement there. Okay, so um, what I say for beginners and intermediate, early intermediate players is bend your fingers a little bit more so that you get a little bit flatter because in the beginning, uh, when this is quite an unusual bow hold, you might find yourself playing like that. So you get, by bending your fingers, can you see, you get closer to this flat idea of playing. I hope that answers your question. Should there be a little downward position of the right hand to help with the proper finger position on the bow? I hope this is, gives you some idea and I'm hoping this I'm addressing what you mean by that. If not, write again and I'll come back to it. Um, ne the next question is, ma'am, as a beginner, what violin would you suggest? Super question. Uh, because, thank you for asking this question, because many people play as a beginner on violins that aren't really good enough. There are lots of violins. I had another look again the other day, and you can buy a violin for about £30 on Amazon. Please steer well clear of those violins. Um, they don't have a good sound. They're quite often they're meant as toys for children so that they could pretend violin play, pretend to play the violin. Uh, what you want in a violin is that it is properly set up before you start to learn because in itself violin playing is already quite a difficult skill. It is much more difficult than learning to drive a car or learning to play tennis and if you compare it with that it's about 10 times as difficult. So if you then use materials that aren't helping you to build up your technique, you're setting yourself up for trouble, you see. So I always say to people, invest in a good quality instrument, as good a quality as you can afford. That's always going to give it back, to give back the pleasure and the ease of playing. Um, what am I looking for in a good violin is that it is set up properly. And what is meant by that? In order to press the strings down here, your fingers need to, your strings need to be sitting just slightly above the fingerboard. And I'm going to come really close to the camera now, and I'm hoping that you can see it. 
that this, if you look at the strings, you can perhaps see that they are a bit further away from the fingerboard, which is this black thing on this end, and a little bit closer to the fingerboard there. And that is because that there is an angle here. And my bridge, this thing here, is slightly higher. So it, it is a very precise angle. You don't want your, your strings to be higher than about half a nail above the fingerboard, like, like that on this end. And you don't want it to be any lower on this end so that the string touches the fingerboard because it's going to rattle. So the string height needs to be very precise. If, if the string height is too low, you can't press the, the string down because it's already touching the fingerboard. If the string height is too high, so the bridge is too tall, shall we say, then you're going to use extra pressure to press the strings down to stop the strings and play the different notes, you see. So the height of the bridge is of vital importance. And you can check on your own instrument, about half a nail is how high the string should be. That's point one. The second point is, and that is when you get to a slightly more advanced level, the violin will be set up in such a way with the sp spacing of the strings in such a way that you can press two fingers on one string, um, one thing on <laughs> one finger on two strings, and you can do that quite high up. So my violin is set up to the width of my fingers. That means that the spacing of the strings here on the bridge has been worked out depending on the, my, the width of my fingers so that I can still play one finger on two strings quite high up. Can you see that? Now, just the other day, I had new people come to me and the strings were literally, the, 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 e, the G string was right on this end and the E string was right on that end. And she couldn't even play two fingers, to, uh, one finger on two strings right here. And that is one of the earlier things that you learn. So you don't want you, yourself to set up for trouble by buying an instrument which is not properly set up because you can practice like mad and it's not going to happen, isn't it? If the violin can't give it to you, you can't get it out of the violin. Same with tone quality. <laughs> tone quality is my hot issue, as you might have guessed. Um, if we're constantly working to create a good sound, a ringing sound, as the previous person has asked. If the violin doesn't do a ringing sound because it's made of very thick and stiff wood, then, then you can practice for a ringing sound, whatever you like, but it's not coming. So my best um, suggestion for you is to make sure that you play on as good a violin as you can afford. And that, of course, is a very... Um, subjective thing especially if you get when you get more advanced you want to get an even better quality violin not just upgrade in size of the violin uh, but also upgrade in quality because you're going to learn techniques that if your violin or your bow doesn't have the flexibility and the, the quality to get the techniques you might practice and it's all a big waste of time you see um, just uh, yesterday, I set up a new Amazon shop, and um, I've set it up for uh, Amazon UK. So if you want to look at my shop on Amazon, I've got suggestions for you there with good quality instruments. Generally, I would say stick with Stentor 1 for beginners, and as soon as you hit the intermediate level, go up as a minimum requirement on a stent or two. But stay well clear of any other brands that have recently sprung up. I can't even remember them now, so I won't call them out here. Um, but find a violin that is as good quality as you can possibly afford. Not only have you got the pleasure of a nicer sound, it's also the ease of playing and learning all those tricky techniques that will save you a lot of time. So let me have a look at another question. Ah, yes, that, uh, Deborah, this is a good question. Uh, Deborah asks, uh, this is the question about the hand position and the bow. My hands move to the top of the bow when I'm playing. And that is that happens with a lot of people. So rest assured that it's not just you who comes across this issue. It's not the end of the world, I think. Uh, if you play here, you can still make a very nice sound, but that has something to do 
with the softness of your thumb. And your thumb, I hope you can see this. Let me see if I can position myself in such a way. You can see here, this is the heel of the bow. And you can see this little round section. Now, most people think you need to put your thumb in there. That's not the case. You need to put your thumb here where the heel, the frog, is just finishing. You can see a tiny bit of wood here before this rubber protective material is there. And that's where your thumb goes. And if you feel yourself sliding up when you play this way, which is, I think, what you mean, uh, it means that you're probably squeezing the bow a little bit too hard or that you may have got in between the hair and the stick too far. So what you need to do is bend your thumb and just use the tip of your thumb. And I'll see if I can show this to you. I'm going to squeeze it really hard now so that I get an indent in my finger, in my thumb. Can you see that? That indent is on the right hand side of my nail. So this, this side. And that is where I touch the bone. You might try that and hopefully you'll stay better, not squeeze so hard, but hold it gently. Hopefully that helps. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Natasha, thank you for this lovely question. Natasha asked, uh, um, asked this question, how do I know if my violin is in tune? Very good point because um, I know very few people who have got perfect pitch who will know an A is an A and an E is an E. Um, the easiest thing is if you buy a tuning app or perhaps if you have a tuning for, I say buy a tuning app, download a free tuning app or um, have pitch pipes or a tuning fork or you've got these little snarky things that you can clip on, play the note and then it will give you green or red light depending on whether your note is too high or too low. So you'd want to know, first of all, uh, the names of the strings are G for the lowest string, D for the second from left string, A from the second from right string, and E. And then find those notes in your tuning app. And I'll show you my tuning apps that I've got. Let me just see. Um, where have I got my tuning apps? There we go. Um, I normally have this tuning app, which is called Violin Tuner. You can just download it for free from the App Store. But um, just recently, someone said, suggested this one to me, and it's Violin Tuner, and it's a purple thing. So when you've got that, it will. I think it will tell you. Let's just try this, shall we? So D, that's your D. Oh, then we get adverbs. Oh my, what am I doing? Um, so D, it says too high, too low, okay? So you might then tune your violin, either with the big pegs or if you have them with adjusters, and see if you can work it. So for tuning the violin um, big distances, you use these pegs. Sometimes these pegs are a little bit sticky, so I warn you always to loosen the big pegs before you tighten them because it might be that they, they suddenly go and then you snap the string if you go too far up. So if you use the big pegs, always turn it so that it loosens. You can see here in the peg, peg box which way that is. And if you have got fine tuners right here, uh, that tunes... A little bit so you might start with this and then use your app go backwards and forwards all the time that is quite a time-consuming thing so it may well take you 15 minutes or longer to tune your violin if you're not used to that okay so if you find it completely impossible to do visit your local music shop and ask somebody to get you started uh, because tuning a violin that's been sitting in a loft for a long time um, is is really quite a skilled job so if you can't work it then visit your local violin maker or your music shop just to help you on your way. And then you want to tune as frequently as you can. So once a day at least, uh, because then you can tune little distances and your violin will start to stay better in tune. But the violin is a natural product and it moves. It moves with temperature. It moves with different atmospheric pressures. So don't be surprised if you have a rainstorm or a thunderstorm, your violin goes out of tune. If you leave it in your hot car, 
it will go out of tune. So uh, tuning is a thing that needs to become frequent to be the most successful. Now, let me see. Oh, hello from Florida. Welcome, Florida. You must have got, got up quite early this morning. So nice to see that you've made it. I watch all your videos and they're so helpful. Thank you very much. I'm a complete beginner. Well, I just really enjoy making these videos and that is why I set up this channel and it is lovely to hear all your wonderful comments. I know all the lessons are free and sometimes I suggest you might buy a book if you are in any position to support this channel so that I can make more videos, you can use PayPal and, and email me at info at brownstrings.com. There is also, if you look on this YouTube channel, in the channel banner, right at the top of the home page, shall I call it, there is a little button so you can uh, get a direct link if you want to. So feel free. Uh, but I'm very, very happy to help, and it's lovely to see you here. Let me answer some more questions here. Let me see. Um, thanks a lot. That was very helpful. How good fit me. Shoulder vest, position fingerboard to flat different if I'm using a shoulder vest. Yes. Uh, let me explain. Thank you for this question, Didik. I hope I'm saying your name all right. Okay. Um why do we use a shoulder rest? Look, that's my shoulder rest underneath my um, violin. If you want to get the link to a shoulder rest, go onto my Amazon shop. I'll put a link to that UK shop um, in the video below so that you can easily click it. I'm using this shoulder rest. Why do we use a shoulder rest in the first place? Let me take it off and you can see. If I rest my violin on my shoulder here, you can see there is a massive gap between my jaw and my chin rest, which is this thing. Now, ideally, I want to hold my violin, balancing it on my shoulder, so I can do that like this and then hold it as a balance between my jaw and my shoulder. But look what's happened to my shoulder. I need to lift it up massive, massively, so that I narrow this gap, you see, because if I leave my shoulder in its lowest position, I've got this space that I need to fill up. And that's where a shoulder rest comes in. Now, this shoulder rest is fully adjustable. I'm not promoting it. There are different <laughs> shoulder rests available, but I choose this one because it is so flexible. I can make this leg longer or shorter and this one too. Then this is bendy material. I can bend it so that it follows the shape of my collarbone. You can probably see I've got quite a pronounced collarbone and I have shaped my shoulder rest so that it sort of hooks on that collarbone so it doesn't slip. It's also anti-slip material so that it stays there. But you can see if I put it on, how well, I still have to grip it a little bit, but how low my shoulder is look, that's just in this normal position, can you see, with my shoulder rest on. And now I've filled up this gap. I quite like it because uh, I want to have a little bit of space to sometimes lift up my head, you see. Uh, but most of the time I'm holding my violin with this corner of my jaw here. You can feel that pointy bit if you feel it. And that here is on the chin rest. <laughs> so that again is that's just a bit of an archaic word. They call this the chin rest because in the olden days they used to play more here. Nowadays, we try not to have our chin on the chin rest, but our jaw on the chin rest, so that we can have a balanced violin hold. You see, now I can just hold the violin with my neck. My neck muscles are quite strong at the back here. And if my neck gets tired, I can just hold it slightly with my left hand. And I think that's where you might have difficulty getting the intonation right, because, because you're playing without a shoulder rest. You are only holding the violin up with your left hand which doesn't then allow your left hand to be free to do other things which it needs to do it needs to play with fingers sometimes quite complicated sections so this violin hold with the shoulder rest is quite a delicate balance can you see so try that try to find a shoulder rest and you might even construct a shoulder rest with several sponges or something so that you start to feel the difference and then Eventually, you might invest in a proper high-tech one, and it will make your playing a lot easier still. Now then, questions are coming in hard and fast. So let me uh, just scroll back for a moment. 
to where we were. Um, okay. Hello, Mark. And Mark says, um, as a complete beginner, what good exercises can be done to get my fingers used to the violin fretboard faster? I will tell you, there are some really good exercises. Um, you call it the fretboard. I know exactly what you mean, but since we don't have frets on the violin, unlike the guitar, we call it the fingerboard. And what you might like to do as a complete beginner is start your finger, your first finger, a little bit away from the beginning of the string. I always say to people, when they first start, pretend my finger is here and then yours comes next, okay? So my first finger is a little bit away from the start of the string. Then my second finger has the same distance once again between your first and second fingers as the distance that you had here, okay? My third finger comes right next to the, to the second finger. Can you see that I've got two gaps now and my fingers close together and your fourth finger when it comes, it comes a space away. And what you might try and do to make your fingers get used to using these positions, like eventually you'll have your muscle memory and the, the sound that will tell you whether your fingers are in, in the right place, but you might just start with this exercise. That looks like a silly little exercise, but it's actually a very useful one. Try to let it come down your fingertip in exactly the same place all the time. Now let's put this one and let's do the same with my second finger. Okay, and we really wake up your fingertips there. Note also that my finger lifts up from here. So I might pretend that there's a little rubber band over the top of my finger here, and I can stretch the rubber band so imagine you pull here and it goes up and now I let it ping and that makes my finger fall down on the string now this finger you want to get used to always falling down in the same place so practice that now I'm now having these two fingers down simply to show you but what you ought to do for a good technique is have these two fingers hover so not there but over the strings, I was just showing you, because you can see my second finger better that way, you see. Do the same thing with the third finger, but the third finger is coming down right next to the second finger, can you see? It's not got a space between them, but it's right by the side. And some people have, of course, leaner fingers than others. If you have very chubby fingers, that can happen, you might well squeeze your fingers together. On the other hand, if you have super, super thin fingers, that feels like a little gap. So that's an individual difference, isn't it? But as a rough guide, it's got to be together with the second finger. And the fourth finger is a space away. And this is very useful exercise as well. And you can very clearly see, I think, here, let me do it this way, that my fourth finger falls down from this base joint here. Okay, so... That is a very good exercise. Can you see? You can perhaps see the base joint here. That's where my finger comes down from. So do those exercises and you will very quickly become very, very uh, competent on the violin. Well done, good question. Um, let me see. Hello from Nepal. Now, that is very nice to see you here. Uh, thank you for joining me from all over the world, all of you, from Florida to Nepal to Indonesia. Well done. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you. Oh, how do I practice vibrato? Now, that is also a lovely question, and lots of people want to play with vibrato. There is actually a separate vibrato video on my channel. I don't know if you found it. It's an older one, so you've got to perhaps... Oh, I've forgotten that. <laughs> there are so many videos now on my on my channel that I don't quite know which one is where. Um, there probably is, I may be completely wrong here, forgive me if I am. Um, uh, a playlist techniques, Drop. you see the playlist, you, you see the channel banner and then it has a home and about and you find a section playlists. Click on that and you see a drop down of all the different playlists 
and there should be one called Technique. And in that, there is a step-by-step -step video how to learn vibrato. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail because we've got a lot of questions to go through, but I can point you to that video. Do watch it and practice it frequently. Vibrato is such a thing uh, that you need to practice day in, day out to get your muscles strong enough to be able to play vibrato. Vibrato, people always say to me, gosh, a vibrato is much harder work than I think. And it's very manageable. You can learn it, uh, but be aware that it's, it's quite a powerful thing. Now, vibrato, I should also add, is a skill that comes when the body is ready for it to come. So if you practice the vibrato video with the video that I've just indicated and it won't work, Please don't despair because it just means that when you learn a new skill, um, you do it with far too much muscle pressure, isn't it? Uh, I'm sure that if I learned to play basketball, I would hold the bow really, really, the ball really tightly. Or if I learned to play something else like tennis, I would really squeeze my racket because I can't play tennis. And I would use far too much power to do that. So once you are more accomplished on the violin and you start to relax into it, um, your muscles can become softer to achieve the same result. And that is when the body is ready to start to learn vibrato. So vibrato can take any time between three days and nine months to learn. And please, if you start practicing these and you think, because this is the first exercise to slide like that, if you think, I can't even move my hand, then just wait three months and try it again and see if your muscles are loose enough to be able to do that. And, of course, later they go like that. And your fingers become very relaxed as well. Uh, but you want to get to that state of relaxation before you can start learning vibrato. So if you can't yet do it, there's nothing wrong with you playing. It's just a bit early in the technique. I hope that answers your question. But, but do find the playlist technique and there's a vibrato video in there. Um, hey, I wanted to know how to support this channel. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I remember you saying YouTube takes a lot of the donation. Yes, they do. Now, nobody has today yet used the super stickers. That's fine. <laughs> you can do that if that's what you fancy, but don't worry if not. Um, let me just write it actually in the comments section. Um, you go straight onto PayPal and it is info at proamstrings.com. If you want to find that, and that's PayPal. Have I now just um, deleted that message? <laughs> Sorry, I'll do it again. Info at proamstrings.com. Am I just not spotting my own? Ah, that's it. So, uh, of course. If you want to get more videos uh, and you want to support this channel, please go ahead and use that uh, with your donations. But let me carry on now. Um, where have I got to? Um, okay, Tommy Matthews. Thank you for that message, <laughs> Tommy Matthews. Uh, Kripesh says, I'm a beginner, a few months of playing violin following your Suzuki course. Thank you for your teachings. One that still bothers me is that my bow bounces as soon as I start increasing the tempo. Yeah, the very good question, Kripesh. Thank you for, um, for asking that question. It happens to a lot of people. Let me say that first. So completely normal. And it has something to do with tension in your upper arm. As I was just saying, if you are learning, if you are learning a new skill, you do that with much more tension. That is, then that is what is strictly necessary. And I do the same thing if I start to learn anything new that I don't know how it goes. So that's quite natural. Um, so what we want to do is start to learn to get rid of tension in your upper arm. And I'll give you an example. Let me just get my violin, and this is how you can practice it. And um, in my last live class, somebody asked this, the exact same question and I got a comment later on from this person saying I've practiced it 
and it's done the job so it works this this exercise really works so usually um again i'm going to apologize for the quality sound i know that it is not ideal and we're trying to do something about it but i'll show you what i mean so i'm going on the d string for now and you will find that your bouncy bow usually happens about here sort of middle two point bit so in this area of the bow uh, that is because the bow is made to bounce there how awful is that later on when you are a little bit more advanced you need that bounce in the bow uh, but for now it can be a right pain if it does that so you bow as soon as you can hear the bounce feel the bounce coming along stop and drop your right shoulder and your right elbow because if i play with a lot more tension the bow is much more likely to bounce you see so you do your bow stroke oh it's beginning to bounce stop drop all of that so your right shoulder and your right elbow and now continue to bow it won't happen in the up bow most likely next bow stroke give it another go oh here it comes it starts to bounce stop drop it all down and then carry on playing now on your third bow stroke you might start to anticipate it's going to bounce in the same place if I don't do anything. So you might sort of, as a precaution, already drop this down on your next bow stroke. And you might find the bowing gets less. Now, this is something that is not cured in 10 minutes or in a day. But in three weeks' time, when you practice that every day, you might suddenly think, did I just play without any bouncing? And that's when you start seeing the results. So persevere, just stopping dropping it all down and that should do the trick. Good luck with it and let me know at some point whether that has helped. Um, big fan of yours and complete beginner here from Amsterdam. <laughs> Hello from Amsterdam. <laughs> I'm Dutch as you know, so I'm speaking just a couple of words of Dutch. Um, I always use a mobile app to tune. When should I switch to tune by ear? A good question. Um, whatever you like. You can just keep tuning with the app all the time or what you see professionals do. If you look at orchestras, when you go to the Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam or any orchestra or you watch it on TV, you hear that an orchestra has an A from the oboe and that A gets taken on by all the violins. So that is how you might use your app, is tuned towards the A. And then the violin is tuned in fifths. So each string is five notes apart from the other strings. So if I play a D, for instance, let me start going on D. And then you sing. Da, 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 da. That would be the sound of your A. One, two, three, four, five. There's your sound of your A. From A, if your A is in tune. One, two, three, four, five. Excuse my singing, I'm a bit hoarse today. That is the sound of your E. Now, let me have your my D again. Now I'll go five notes down. Da da di di da. And there's your G string, you see? So you can start with that exercise until you start to hear it much better. And then you can start to tune two notes together. And that's when you can really start to hear when the notes are perfectly in tune. Because when you play, um, a perfect fifth that's called that is the distance between your bottom note and your top note five notes a fifth and um, they will sound those two notes will sound as if they both melt together uh, and I'll show you that <laughs> fine-tuners if you have them or your big pegs to start tuning your strings in such a way of course you have found the, the rough tuning by singing the five notes 
and then tune them precisely in tune so that they match together. That takes a lot of skill. So again, you hear me say this time and time again, this is not a thing that you can achieve overnight or today or in the next week or so, but in six months you can think, ah, oh, okay, I start to hear it now. So persevere with that because it is lovely if you can tune two strings together. Um, okay. I'll try to contact you. Ah, um, I can see a, a, an entry, Samurai and Ninja History. Um, thank you for that message and thank you for following this up. And I'm happy to see that you um, are enjoying playing the videos. I have actually emailed somebody back who lives in Kings Lynn. So maybe that email has not arrived. Can you email again and I will get back to you? Okay, or check your spam folder. All right, so... Uh, but lovely to see you here, and thank you for joining me here. Let me see. Um, where have I got to? Raisa Graham. Is there any way of making a violin quieter? I got my first one yesterday and was setting it out. My mum asked me if I mean, make <laughs> weird screaming noises. Yeah, I totally can sympathise. And the violin is much louder than many people <laughs> often think. When I, when I was younger and I lived with my parents, my parents had a cat and the cat just couldn't stand it and it would fly up to the top of the curtains whenever I played. Unfortunately, um, I played rather a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> that was bad luck for the cat. Yes, you can make a violin quieter, um, but I wouldn't recommend it to, uh, to use every day. So if you have lots of people in the house and you want to just mute yourself temporarily, that's fine. I can show you the mute that I've got. Um, and I'll also show you, that's actually quite nice. Uh, you can see this little thingy here. It's a little clip-on thingy that I can put over my bridge and it dampens the sound. Let me hear you. Again, I'm apologizing for the sound. Um, and hopefully next time when we have a live class, I will have um, some software in place that mitigates the sound issue a little bit. So this is without anything, it's quite loud. Now I'm putting my mute on. Can you hear that? I've also got a hotel mute. So if I need to play in hotels, hang on a second, I'll, I'll get it. And this is the strongest of mutes. I'll put that on, listen to this. See, it's quite, quite soft, but I have to say big but, if you use this all the time, it's not good for tone development. It's fine for practicing your fast runs or things that you can't remember in a hotel room, so you practice your fingers. But please, please, please don't play with a mute on day in, day out, because it, it, it really will, um, um, stop developing your tone quality and that is so important in all that violinists do you see so carry on developing your tone quality when there's nobody else that you can disturb by taking everything off uh, but by all means um, experiment a little bit simple trick if you don't want to invest in any mutes you can buy them and they're not very expensive this is a little um, mute that looks like that you can also buy these little black round circular things uh, that also do the trick the advantage of these is that they can stay permanently on your violin so you have it always with you if they don't rattle i'll fix that later um, but you can do a simple trick and find a clothes peg and put it on your bridge and you can either peg it like that or you can peg it on the top and it, it does make the violin a little bit softer as well. And why does it do that? Because it stops the bridge vibrating as hard so that the vibrations don't go into the instrument too much. So that is how it dampens it. I hope that's answered your question. Um. <laughs> Hello, Anthony. <laughs> nice to read your comments. We will sort something out on that. Um, middle of work, so we will not hear answer. 
yes um and you can come back this video this is for everyone if you didn't get it the first time um this video will stay on my youtube channel so you can watch it back all right okay and then we've got a message that says hello from houston texas welcome houston texas uh, lovely to hear from you and really lovely from all of you who've written wherever you are in the world oh my gosh we're running out of time a little bit aren't we we're, we're quickly finding some new um, questions. Uh, playing vibrato is the second video in the techniques playlist on the channel. Thank you so much for uh, alerting us to this. So playing vibrato, the vibrato video is the second video in the techniques playlist on the channel. Lovely. I grabbed my violin to try and copy what you were doing earlier and find it helpful. Oh, I'm really happy. You see, and that is what I love about doing these live classes and also the videos. You guys are all so relevant with your questions and you have such lovely comments. So thank you for that. And it's lovely to hear that you are in the Philippines too. So going through my um, chat box list. So here again, I come across my own message that says, Info at primestrings.com on PayPal if you're interested. Thanks for answering my question. I will have a look at the video again to learn vibrato. Cathy from Melbourne. Can you say all over the world? I'm absolutely chuffed to bits to read that. Thank you. <laughs> it's just lovely to see where everyone is. Uh, thanks, Tommy says. Wanted to support you as the channels help so much. Ah, what a lovely comment. And this is, that gives me so much pleasure if people like you ask these super relevant questions and then hopefully one or two comments will really help you. So thank you for your lovely things. Thanks a lot for the bouncing bow tip and the whole session. Finger patterns make a different, are finger patterns making a different in sound? Um. That's a very good question and an intricate one to answer. Um, finger Playing with different finger patterns shouldn't really affect the sound too much because the sound on your violin you make with the bow. The bow is the life of the violin, we always say. It's how you breathe and how you sing with the violin. Uh, but if you play finger patterns and think in finger patterns on the violin, it makes it much easier to split your brain in half because you'll find in every single video that I make, um, we make this distinction between the left hand and the right hand. And if the left hand goes more on autopilot because you know your finger patterns, uh, then it's much easier to focus on the bow. So yes, there is a distinct correlation between the two, but not immediately. It's not that when your pattern is all right, your sound is better. Of course, when your pattern is more precise, your violin's more in tune, hopefully. But that has nothing to do with the quality sound. The quality sound is more, can you play a clear sound, a pure sound uh, that is free from scratches or ruffles in the sound, you see? So I hope that makes sense. Uh, ah, we're a couple of Dutchies here, aren't we? <laughs> Hello, Nederlanders. <laughs> Sorry if you're in another part of the world, but Dutch people always want to connect with other Dutch people, don't they? Lovely to see you. Um, let me carry on a few more questions and then we've got to call it a day. Um, whenever I start doing vibrato, the whole violin shakes, although my fingers are so relaxed. How could I shock my violin? Um, special thanks from Egypt. Good. You you guys are now starting to show off, aren't you? So I love it. Welcome, Egypt. And yes, it happens with a lot of people uh, that the violin starts to shake. And that is, why is that? Let me see. You might want to hold it a little bit more. Now, this is actually not what I want to say, but I'm saying it nevertheless you want to hold it a bit more strongly with your neck so that your violin can't move. Because obviously, if your violin moves along and you do this and your violin goes like that, the effect of your vibrato is a bit less than you would otherwise do. Old-fashioned trick, which you can try at home, is have a little cloth. And this is how I learned to play vibrato, which is I never thought that I would go back and say that to someone, but it is a good trick. Put it right here and then lean your violin against the wall. I haven't really got a wall, but actually I do. 
let me see if I can work that and if you can still see me. Oh no, it doesn't work. I can't reach it. Um, so I'm I'm just having this there for protection, but I'm leaning against a wall, and then you can perhaps see when I do this that um I'm now wedging my violin between my neck and the wall, and that keeps the violin like that, you see, and it keeps it still so it can't move. And now I can play you about it. Can you see that? So try that, see if that works for you. And then gradually you'll you'll find that initially when you practice that, you start to lean your violin into the wall so it have it is tight and it's really secure. But then gradually you want to start softening this up so that you're not squeezing it into your neck because that starts hurt after a while if you squeeze it really hard. Um, so that it softens up and then eventually one day you can be free from that wall and play like that and still be still. I'm hoping this helps. Let me know underneath one of the videos. I'll get to see all these comments, you see, which is lovely for me. And let me know if that helps. All right. Um, how often is the live class? <laughs> also a good question. Um, I started doing these live classes, I can't remember, a couple of months ago, March, March or April. Uh, and... Um, I've got into a sort of routine every second Friday of the month, but actually at the end of June, I'm going to go on holiday, fingers crossed, if I can, uh, because of COVID, of course. So um, I might do one sort of in August, but I can't promise it. Um, we'll come back again, hopefully second Friday of uh, September. So that seems a long way off, but we've got the whole summer to go. Um, I do usually promote it on my Facebook channel and on this YouTube channel. And so uh, if you subscribe to the channel, you get a message on when the next live class is. So um, you might later on subscribe to this channel and then you get notified whenever the new live class is on. OK, but I'll try to do them every month, except with the summer coming that there's a little bit of a break coming. Um, Ah, oh, somebody is saying, really enjoying the quick bomb lessons. Um, thank you. Um, I'd hoped that the quick bomb method would be a bit more popular than it is. So it's really nice to hear that somebody is enjoying those lessons. Thank you for saying that. Um, so please share it with all the people that you know who might be interested in learning the violin. Uh, and different patterns make different sound. Ah, Germany. <laughs> Lovely. Um, yes, well... This is a question, I'll, I'll read out a question for you. Should we play with finger patterns and do different patterns make a different sound? Uh, yes, because different finger patterns have different, makes you play in different musical keys. Now, we're opening a whole new section now. What is a musical key? Um, the note that each piece finishes on tells you which key you're in, provided you're playing chords, but let's assume we're not. So the la look at the last note of your piece. If your last note is, is a D, you're playing in the key of D major, and your finger pattern is that pattern that we have said all along. So wide gap between your second finger, uh, first finger and second finger, and fingers two and three together. Um, this is the case on the D string and the A string. Uh, once you get a little bit further advanced, you start to play in the key of G, and the key of G has a finger pattern, wide second finger on G, wide second finger on D, close second finger on the A string, close second finger on the E string. So as you progress, you then learn the key of G major, the long G major scale, and that has a different finger pattern. So that makes you play in a different key. It's one way of looking at it. You can also check out the key signature in your piece and it will tell you which notes are made sharp. Now, if we play in the key of D major, so you finish your, your piece finishes on a D, um, it will have two sharps at the start of your music. So have a look in your music. You get first you get the that little swirly thing, which is the treble clef, and then you get a couple of hashtags sometimes. Sometimes you get these little Bs which are flats, and we go <laughs> we won't go there now. So the two hashtags, the first one is the one that is slightly higher than the second one. That's the F sharp. 
which tells you play all the notes in this piece that are called F as F sharps, so slightly higher, and all the notes that are called C as C sharps, a little bit higher, in other words, than Cs. And that will get you an F sharp here, second finger on the D string, and a C sharp, second finger on the A string. Now, when you, there's also a set of um, scales, the G major scale, the A major scale, and the D major scale, as a different playlist, scales for beginners, I think it's called. So maybe the person who looked up the Verato video might be so kind to write down exactly where you can find it. And this will tell you about the three different finger patterns in the three most used keys for beginners. When you get a lot more advanced, that all becomes a little bit more complicated. And in total, there are 24 keys. Uh, but by then, hopefully, you won't be thinking so much in finger patterns anymore. But the first three finger patterns, G major, D major, and A major, definitely have the finger patterns. So good luck with that. Um, last question. And then we're going to call it a day. We've been going for over an hour. Goodness me. And your questions are all so good. Um, Priscilla Amoting. Thanks. When I'm joining in from Ghana. Now, we've definitely almost got every continent covered now, isn't it? Welcome, from, welcome, Ghana. It's lovely to see you here. I see that it makes you happy to see everyone comes from. Thanks a lot for the videos. It's really helpful. Well, lots of love back to you, wherever you are. And don't forget, if you want to support this channel, info at proamstrings.com, and you can use PayPal from wherever you are in the world. You can either use the email address, info at proamstrings.com on PayPal, or find the homepage on this YouTube channel. In the banner, there is a link that says support this channel. I'll make sure that I put a link in the description once this video comes live on the channel um, so that you can find a link there as well. It was absolutely my pleasure to answer all your questions. I am very aware that there are one or two questions that I haven't answered, but I'll keep those for next time. So lovely to see you here today. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening or whatever time it is, wherever you are. I'm very honoured to meet you here today. So uh, until next time, goodbye.